Hi, I'm John DeVore. Welcome to the DeVore Fidelity YouTube channel. Today I want to talk a little bit about the way DeVore Fidelity was started as a company. I've been building speakers all the way back since the mid 80s when I was in college. Uh, I built my first pair and I was an audiophile basically as far back as I can remember. I never thought it would make a lot of sense to start a speaker company because there was so much competition. It would be a really tough way to make money. What could I offer that would be different? And that half changed in the year 2000. After I got out of college, I had been selling hi-fi part-time while I did other things. I, I was an illustrator for a while and I, I was a musician in some East Village bands. But in the year 2000, a friend of mine decided he was gonna start selling vintage integrated amps out of his living room in Brooklyn. Amps from the 60s and 70s that were not the, the flagship expensive tier of gear that everyone had heard of. So, you know, everyone knows about the, the vintage tube amps of Macintosh and Marantz and Fisher. This was the tier below that uh, that were more affordable. These were amps from Sherwood, from Pilot, Scott, Heathkit, even uh, Dynaco, obviously, is a, is a very famous example of these. And these are great sounding, much more, much more reasonably priced, quite compact, great sounding and reliable gear as long as it's been checked out. So his idea was to sell these, but they're not a lot of power and they're designed for higher sensitivity and higher impedance speakers for the most part, which were the speakers that were available at the time that these amps were new. And rather than trying to find good examples of the speakers from that era, 70s speakers and 60s speakers, which by the late 90s and in the year 2000 tended to be pretty beat up, uh, also quite a lot, quite a bit larger than what would be in a hi-fi shop in the late 90s, and not really sonically what uh, a customer would expect um, in the late 90s. So I agreed to start building some speakers for him to, to demonstrate his amps with and possibly to sell one or two. And these were just built in my kitchen. Uh, they were funky little two ways. Generally, they were sort of rounded edged rectangles painted in bright colors. They were you know, baby blue, banana yellow, a few different shades of gray. You know, they sounded, they sounded great on the amps. He did sell a few pairs. But within less than a year, that friend of mine decided that he would get more serious. And he found a storefront in Manhattan and decided he was going to start a real brick and mortar hi-fi shop with walk-in traffic. At that point, it was obvious that my weird little fruit colored speakers were not going to be appropriate for a venue like that. And I needed to either move on or rethink the line and come up with more stable, consistent products that had real furniture grade cabinets and that could compete really with what was in shops at the time. So I hunted around a little bit in Brooklyn for a cabinet maker that was going to be able to make really good looking, consistently well-built cabinets for me. I found a guy way out deep in Brooklyn and we did some prototyping with him and it was a disaster. They were very inconsistent, not nearly to the level that I felt was necessary for me to start the company. So I was, I was ready to throw in the towel. And one evening I was at my local watering hole, uh, which at this point was Max Fish on Ludlow Street down in the Lower East Side, because that's where I was living at the time. And I ran into a hi-fi customer of mine. This is a guy that I had sold some gear to, some Conrad Johnson, some, some JM Lab speakers. And so we were hanging out playing pinball, having a few beers, and he looked at me and was like, what's wrong? And I told him my experience and how I, I, f I was finding it really impossible to be able to find somebody to make these cabinets for my speaker company. And it looked like I was just going to have to, you know, move on, not, not try to do a speaker company, which was maybe a little bit of a relief. Go back to my slackerly ways. And he looked at me and he said, I'm a cabinet maker. I'm about to go out on my own, start my own company. Let's give it a try. And that guy was Anthony Abate who is my cabinet maker to this day. He is also the founder of Box Furniture Company, uh, the company that makes the beautiful 
hi-fi racks. So the first step was for him to build a pair of sample speakers for me to, to check out. So we got her all arranged and I decided that I was going to unveil the, the new speakers at a party I was going to have. And so I designed a, a beautiful little, uh, well, beautiful on paper, um, little pair of mini monitors with front ports based around my favorite driver of the time. It was, a, it was one of the premium level drivers from Vifa. Uh, which was at that point a Danish manufacturer. It was a little four inch paper cone woofer. And for various logistical reasons, he, he delivered the parts. They were all finished. Uh, they were cherry cabinets with beautiful satin black fronts and backs. Uh, but I was gonna have to glue them on just because of the logistics of timing. So we delivered them today before the party. He gave me the glue that he recommended, which he said was foolproof and was gap filling. Uh, it was a polyurethane glue. So I, f I assembled them. I followed his instructions meticulously, applying the glue and, and clamping them. Got them all in clamps. Came back 10 minutes later just to, to check out on the progress and noticed that there were these bubbles and blooms of these sort of cream colored puffball mushroom looking things exploding out of the seams all the way around the front and rear baffles of this thing. It looked like this crazy puffball mushroom invasion. And it was the glue expanding and gap filling right out of the, out of the gap. <laughs> but the party must go on, so I scraped off as much of it as I could. The party was great, the speakers sounded great, they got a great response. Everyone got a, a nice laugh at my gluing abilities. And the next day I spoke to Anthony. I told him that his cabinetry was beautiful, but there were two things very important that needed to change on the design. The first one, so this is that pair of speakers. The first one was the location of the ports. They're front ported so, so they could be very easy to place. They could even be put in a bookshelf, but while on paper this looked good, in practice it ended up looking like these weird little nostrils. Plus, where's the logo going to go? So the first redesign was, was separating those out to the very edges of the cabinet, leaving me a nice little spot to put my DEF logo. And the second redesign was not having me glue, up, glue them up, at least not with expanding glue. Um, and to this day we actually now use a non-expanding glue put the fronts and backs on uh, and it's worked out very well. So after those two modifications, this went on to become the very first production DeVore Fidelity speaker, the Gibbon 3, which lasted in line quite a while. It had a few minor tweaks along the way, including putting a rear port. The cabinet changed a couple of times uh, to sort of keep up with the times and to try to keep them affordable. Can you hear that? It's stuff happening outside. But at some point in the mid-2000s, Vifa was bought by a Chinese company, Timphony, and all production was moved from Denmark to China, and they completely stopped all production of the premium line drivers. While they assured us that they were going to be able to make the same drivers, after several rounds of prototyping, it was clear that they were never going to be able to make the same kind of quality that they made in Denmark in their Chinese factories. And even ScanSpeak stepped up and said that they would be able to make these drivers. Uh, and while that may be true, they were going to be five times the price that I was paying for the original Vifa units. And there would be no way for me to, to keep the price of these at $2,000. So they, they had to be immediately discontinued so that I could maintain an inventory of these drivers for warranty repair and for non-warranty service down the line. And these were discontinued a little, you know, abruptly too soon for my taste. I do, I love these speakers, but that's the story of the missing link. This is the pair of speakers that links my, my funky fruit flavored silly speakers of the year 2000 and pretty much everything before that to the current production line of stable models and, um, and furniture grade cabinets. So thanks for watching. I'll say goodbye. I hope to see you again soon at the next video. And Lulu Bear and Roxy say goodbye too. Take care.